We're going to begin reading in verse 1, Luke chapter 13. There were present at that time some that told him, Christ, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the other Galileans, because they suffered such things. That was a very, very traditional saying in our Lord's day. If here he was, if if there was something terrible that happened to you, they begin to automatically say, Oh my goodness. You must have really did something bad for that to happen to you. And that's really what the subject is about here. And that's why Jesus said, do you suppose these Galileans that died this horrible death were sinners above all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? Notice our Lord's reply. He clarifies it. I tell you, nay. No. Now we're getting to our subject. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Are those 18 upon whom the tower, he brings up another event, the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were more sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Again, I tell you, nay. And he repeats what he had already said. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Two times. And when Jesus says something emphatically, two times, we need to listen. We need to listen. Question. Do you suppose that we perform a lot of unnecessary practices in church? We probably do. Because churches, and this one certainly falls into that category. Churches are very traditional. Baptist churches in particular. We may do some things a little bit different. Some of our churches have gone to a more contemporary type music. Some have began doing a little bit of contemporary, but also keeping the traditional. And I'll be honest with you, you know how much I love music. It really don't bother me. As long as it exalts the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't bother me a bit. But worship styles, yeah, yeah, we probably do a lot of things that may be considered unnecessary. However, most of us are nowhere near as flexible when it comes to doctrinal matters. Here's the danger. There are a lot of churches who are changing. And normally, it's going to begin in the pulpit. They are changing things that for years and years and years 
have been foundationally preached. They have stopped teaching and preaching a lot of things that were just foundational. And I'm just going to stay with Baptist churches. I have been told, and I'm not an authority on this, but I have been told that several years ago, some of our own seminaries begin to stress to young pastors to be that they soften up on bloody religion and preaching because people are offended by it. And I didn't understand that when I first heard about it, and I don't understand it now. Folks, where would we be without the blood? We would be lost in our sins. Now, that didn't mean that every time the preacher goes to the pulpit, he, he, he preaches a message on the cross, hopefully, He's preaching what the Lord is telling him to preach. But I've never shied away from that. And I guess some of the most heartbreaking times in the pulpit for me is when I preach on the cross. Breaks my heart. The Lord's Supper moves me. So much. But getting back to the things that it seems that people are eradicating from the pulpit, one of them is repentance. So the title of the study tonight is, is in the form of a question. Is repentance really necessary? Is it really necessary? Or are we so much more enlightened now that we all of a sudden realize that that's an old fable? That it really isn't necessary. So let me give you four reasons tonight why I believe that repentance is absolutely necessary. Maybe we ought to get a little definition on repentance. What is it? Most of the time when we define repentance or think about it, we think about that's when we become sorrowful. We realize that we are sinners. And by the way, going back to what I said a moment ago, when pastors are soft selling this thing of repentance, you know why they do that? Because repentance understood properly really exists. We don't like to admit that we're sinners. And that's the whole foundational thing with repentance. We don't like to admit that. We don't want to acknowledge over the weekend. We never get people saved until they get lost. Repentance, the ideal or concept of repentance, having to admit that we are sinners, that digs at our pride. Because we don't want to do that. 
First reason that repentance is absolutely necessary is because of the condition of mankind. The condition of mankind. What do I mean when I speak of man's condition? Conditionally speaking, man is a sinner. There's no way to get around it. Romans 5 verse 12, let me kind of take you on a little trip. Romans 5 verse 12, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was that? Adam, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Now watch this. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Why is repentance necessary? Because we're sinners. And I said a moment ago, part of repentance is, in reality, being sorry, sorrowful for the fact that we're sinners. But there's a part of it also that goes beyond that. We acknowledge that we are sinners, and in repentance, we turn away from it. We turn away from it. That's a part of repentance that I don't think is preached anywhere near enough. Romans 3, verse 23, you're familiar with this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So, we're all sinners. No big deal, huh? Yes, it is a big deal. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And here's the thing that's so important about that. It goes beyond just physical death. Now, that's true. Had sin not entered into the world and mankind fell and become a sinner, I don't think anyone would have ever died. I don't think we would have had to go to funeral homes or anything else. I think Adam would still be alive. Eve too. Physical death, yes. But it goes beyond that. Here's the more important thing. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. And it's that death that separates us from God. So why is repentance absolutely necessary? Because of the condition of all mankind. And there's no one that is outside of that. No one. Second, not only the condition of man, but the coming judgment also makes it necessary. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die. Now, we've already talked about that. We've spent a great deal of time in the first point talking about death. And that's bad. Because of sin, we experience physical death. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, there's also spiritual death. But that isn't the end. I didn't read that whole verse. It is appointed unto men once to die, 
But after this, death, the judgment, the judgment. You know, I've, I, I've thought before, if we just lived for a certain amount of years on earth, we had a span in which we lived, and we died, that wouldn't be the worst of all things. Let me, let me show you what I mean. With age... With age comes difficulty. Physical difficulty. Yeah. We groan and we moan. We have to work ourselves up to get out of bed of a morning. Some of us are still trying to do the things we did when we were younger. And we're reminded on a regular basis, nope, can't do it. Can't do it. But there's other things. There's things other than just growing old and experiencing the physical aspects that come with growing old. There's other things. There's the heartbreak that we have to experience in life. Seeing someone else die that we love, having to take them out and bury them, it's heartbreaking. And the closer that relationship is, the worse it is. And those who still have their parents with them, watching their parents slowly become just almost a shell of themselves. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Thirty or forty years ago, I had no idea what dementia was. I had no clue. But I do now. I watch my grandmother go through it. I watch my mom go through it to an extent. It's horrible. It is horrible. You watch that person being able to comprehend less and less and less. It's heartbreaking. And although there are drugs that can slow down the process, it did with my mom. It really did. My mom passed away from a lot of physical health problems, but her mind was probably as good as it was when they first diagnosed her. But that isn't the case with everyone. A lot of times the drugs just don't work. One, one of the office things that children have to go through is to go see their loved one and their loved one has no idea who they are. No idea. It's so heartbreaking. If we just lived a span of time and then died... By the time we get to that point, we almost get to the point where we welcome death. We would. My wife and I talked about this just a couple of days ago. Now, don't, don't put us on suicide watch or anything like that. We're, we're, we're both foundational enough to where we know that we're going to live as long God as God desires for us to live. We're good with that. 
And what was funny about it, she brought it up with everything that's going on physically and everything else. We get to the point where we just actually would welcome death. I've heard more. I heard this just Monday when I went to funeral home. I've heard more people say that they actually become envious sometimes of someone who has passed, who knew the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, I don't get that. Hang on a while. Hang on a while. If it was just death, but, but it's more than that. It's the judgment. God judged sin from the very beginning. First, He judged the pride of fallen angels. 2 Peter 2 verse 4. God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That happened in heaven. We are told that, that Satan led an uprising because he wanted to occupy the throne of God. He, he had a legion of others who followed him. And they actually tried to overthrow God. But they couldn't. And it says, God spared them not and cast them down to hell. Judgment. He judged the pollution of the Old Testament. 2 Peter 2 verse 5 said, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah. We talked about this over the weekend. The eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He judged the pride of fallen angels, the pollution of the Old Testament, and the perversion of Sodom. 2 Peter 2 verse 6 says, He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those who should live ungodly. God has judged this world in past. And who are we to think that we're going to escape that judgment. You can only escape it by having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, man's condition, he's what? He's a sinner. The coming judgment makes it necessary. Then the certainty of death. Solomon said there's a time to be born and a time to die. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2. I read this somewhere. I thought it was very fitting. A preacher began to have some health problems, and he went to his doctor, and they did a barrage of tests, all kinds of blood work, they, they took scans, and the story didn't really tell exactly what it was. It was immaterial. But when they got all the test results back, blood work, all of the scans, and everything else, it was not good. So it was this doctor's job to tell the man of God, who no doubt had, had to do this often. Pastor, I don't know how to tell you this, but your condition is terminal. Meaning, there's nothing we can do. You're going to die. Now, the response of the preacher was what was interesting in this story. After telling him 
your condition is terminal, the preacher said, we all are. We all are. None of us will escape death. None of us. Now, if you want to get real theoretic about it, you say, well, if the Lord comes back in my lifetime, I won't have to die. Well, in reality, you will. If He comes and you go up in the rapture, you will experience a change. And you can call that a death. You know why? These bodies would not be fit for heaven. Mine wouldn't. None of us would. We've got to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. All right, one more. The condition of man, sinner. The coming judgment, it's certain. The certainty of death. No one's going to escape it. But I'd like to end on this note. The compassion of Christ makes it necessary. I want you to think with me what Christ did for man's sin. And for this to really affect me, and I would encourage you to do the same thing, Make that personal. Let me, let me say it like this. Notice what Christ did for my sin. My sin. He carried them. He carried them. When did He do that? John chapter 19. Then delivered He, Pilate, Him, Jesus, Therefore unto them, the Jews, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led Him away. Get this, verse 17. And He bearing His cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Even though, and it's now a state issue, has been for several years, even though we still practice execution, except in some states where it's been forbidden. Even though we still have capital punishment on our books, down through the years, there has been an effort to make it as humane as possible. We're past hanging. That's a slow death. It's not instant. We're past the electric chair. That's what it was when I was growing up. You strap you into a chair and turn up the volts. That'd be a painful death. We're past firing squads. Now they administer drugs. And most of you have probably heard there are times when the drugs are not as effective as they should be and that person dies a very slow, horrible death. Every effort has been made to try to make capital punishment as humane as possible. When Jesus died, He had to carry His own cross. Imagine that. He bore His cross. That's what He did for me. He carried my sins. 
He cleansed my sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's why I said earlier in the very, very beginning, don't ever, if you go to a church, if it's not this one, or if this church ever gets a, a, a pastor here that will not preach the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, get rid of him. If you go to a church where they pointedly will not talk about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, go find another one. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So he carried them, he cleansed them, and here's the greatest thing, he cleared them. Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I'm glad that's where I am. I'm in a no condemnation status. Before I was saved, I was condemned because I was a sinner. When I trusted in Jesus Christ, that condemnation was taken away. There is now not when we die, not when we get to heaven. There is now no condemnation. He cleared him. He cleared him. I remember years ago when we were singing, the Hemp Hills had a little song out. What sins are you talking about? Anybody remember that little song? And it really, it's got a great message to it. It would be like someone goes up to the Lord Jesus Christ and points an accusing finger at some child of God and accuses them of sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, what sins are you talking about? They've been cast into a place, an abyss where they cannot be brought up. As far as the east is from the west. I wondered about that a long time. You know why he didn't say the north from the south? Because we can travel and go to the North Pole. We can travel and go to the South Pole. But there is no East Pole. There is no West Pole. So when he said the east from the west, there's no lodging place. They're gone. All right. I hope you wondered about repentance a little bit. I hope that might have answered a few questions. We keep preaching it because the Word of God is foundational when it comes to repentance. Let's stand.